It's hopeless asking you anything. Not if you ask the right questions. How do I get into zombie takeout? Ah, now that's more like it. It gets in here. Hello and welcome to episode 420 of Zombie Takeout. I am so glad we didn't realize 420 was coming up and and, and think of some ridiculous joke to do. Did we, did we already do Reefer Madness? I think we did. Um, because this one worked out so much better for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. Um, but I'm, before we get to this, for some. before we get to this week's movie, um, some list, we've got some listeners submitted. Um, this one goes back to our Karis Hell review. I normally don't go that far back with uh, listener submitted, but this one's kind of special. It's from Steve Rudzinski on YouTube. Steve Rudzinski is the director of Karis Hill. Um, he said, this was a joy to listen to. It really means so much to hear folks who get it in every way. Uh, so glad you enjoyed the film so much, all of you. But if you haven't seen it, we are trying to make part two. They funded Carousel <laughs> 2 on Kickstarter. I chipped in like 10 bucks uh, the night I right after I edited that episode last week's episode, uh, and they had already passed the goal. Great, I think definitely can't wait for a sequel to that. Yeah, um, Steve Rudzinski mentioned I think it was on Twitter that um, it'll be they'll be filming it next year. Um, obviously, no word on the uh, release because they just filmed it and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So hopefully, filming will happen next year. And I mean, also, how many more ways could they that that horse possibly kill people? Is just I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's got to go to space at some point. That's true. That's usually part three, isn't it? Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, they could skip part two. You know, pull a, a, a movie I'm going to be referencing later tonight. Um, oh. Uh, we've also got some listeners submitted uh, from Facebook. This is from Diana Stevens uh, in reference to last week's film, Lady Hawk. She said. That one was my that was one of my favorites uh, in its day. It did not hold up to the test of time for the most part, but it was fun when it came out. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think I even mentioned in last week's episode we reviewed it. Yeah, I I liked it as a kid when it came out. Mm-hmm. I totally had a you know I taped it off of like Showtime or something, but you know I watched it a few times as a kid. Mm-hmm. That's and because I, we're starving for good fantasy entertainment, oh yeah. though, yeah. you know? I suspect that's also something a lot of people would say about this week's film, which is from 1986, Labyrinth. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by the 80s. It all seemed like a good idea at the time. And also brought to you by Jareth the Goblin King, responsible for dozens of anime characters throughout and, the years. And literally every anime vampire, and I say that as an anime <laughs> geek. Yeah, I'm not even an anime geek, and I just kind of looked at it and I'm like, this is this is exactly what they fucking did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every time. All right. Uh, so we have a bratty-ass <laughs> <laughs> girl who... Um, who just uh, doesn't give a fuck about anything. But, you know, I, I guess what the writers are going, like, teenagers, what are you going to do about them, huh? And, Take um, that, that cliche scene where, where you know, the, the daughter or her son, usually daughter, is complaining about how her parents never let her do anything and, you know, she always says to watch her kid, turn that up to 11 on the cliches, and that's the beginning of this movie. Yeah. It's uh, so bad that she actually wishes her uh, baby brother away, mm-hmm. which I mean, damn, that's cold, <laughs> cold, cold, cold. And uh, of course, the uh, the goblins are <laughs> awaiting in anticipation for her to say the correct words. And uh, she does. She I mean, it's not even just a throwaway thing. She builds to it and then fucking says it she doesn't say it quite right a few times and they're all anxious for her to say it right and then i got the impression they kind of um gave kind of kind of fed the line to her (laughs) right (laughs) wait for it and um 
Well, she does say it, and then her her baby brother just poof disappears. Mm-hmm. Uh, then she realizes, what have I done? And uh, that that begins her quest to get him back. Now, she's being held by um, oh, I was going to say the Goblin King, but fuck, man, it's just David Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie doing a uh, Doctor Frankenfurter impression. Uh, you kind of get the feeling that it's David Bowie just being David Bowie. <laughs> There's a lot of Frankenfurter, especially in that first. Yeah, scene. you're right. You're right, and especially like the ballroom scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was just like straight out of my unconventional conventionalist mm-hmm. scene, um, or the time warp. Um, yeah. And uh, so, so he's of course not playing fair. He um, throws everything at her to not get the child back and to make this movie as long as possible. Mm. And he succeeds. He succeeds. He gets it up to a good hour and uh, 50 40. minutes. Hour 40. Hour 40. Just yeah, hour 40. Uh, <laughs> hooray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, right. She Along the way, she meets uh, some people who are, they are in the way. They're guardians of the labyrinth. But she winds up converting them into being her own friends. And um, some of them even betray her, but they still bring them back in as friends and forgive them in the end. He just keeps getting chance after chance. (laughs) And uh, it eventually, of course, leads to this big uh, outright battle, um, which kind of made Baron Munchausen's battle scene look like uh, Saving Private Ryan. Mm. <laughs> no, bear in mind it, that scene was almost all Muppets. So, yes. You know, that's kind of the only saving grace of the film is all the Muppets to me. Right, and uh, so she gets to an M.C. Escher painting mm. um, where, they're, where they're keeping the child. Bought, and, a, bought uh, it a half a fucking brain. <laughs> I love that sure. And uh, that was uh, my idea for Purgatory, remember? Or one of the levels mm-hmm. of Purgatory. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, And then uh, hilarity and a weird-ass scene ensues. Mm-hmm. Now, bef- I, it says, before I get to my notes, it says that uh, on, in the opening credits that Terry Jones wrote the screenplay. He wrote the first draft of the screenplay. <laughs> Ah, okay. That explains a lot because you can hear a lot of Jones in it. Mm-hmm. And I perked up. I was like, "Oh my god, this has to be a slam dunk." When you're talking about right. Jim Henson working with, you know, Terry Jones, produced by Lucas. Um, and he's—I mean, you can quibble about his directing, but he's a great producer. Um, but yeah, a lot of people got to the script after that, and you know. Um, I think the story in general is just uh, flawed from the beginning, yeah, though, yeah, honestly. Yeah. Um, and it opens with, well, I got to ask, because you're, you're the Bowie fan between the two of us. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing this was during Bowie's sellout period. I, I have my notes. This is what he referred to as his Phil Collins years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, he himself calls it that. Wow. And it's gr- interesting that you should mention Collins specifically, because... I loved the gated reverb on the drums in the opening song. <laughs> and, you know, we've got all this dated CGI in the in the opening credits. And it... uh, well, the song credits, I mean, all right. It's it's not as bad as what we went through last week, mm-hmm. th- those opening credits. Right. However, when they start playing the same song again. <laughs> yeah, the, the opening <laughs> theme song. Credits replays like four times in the movie and it's but not they, a like but, right after they played it the first time it's kind of like wait um did we just <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad song but i mean it's mid 80s bowie yeah it's it's sellout period bowie so um, well this is why growing up i wasn't a bowie fan mm-hmm. as a kid right. I, you know this is what i thought of bowie that that yeah. kind of music there's kind of like oh you know he's in labyrinth he's in you know <laughs> it's mm-hmm. kind of just a joke. I had no idea uh, until later about his back catalog. <laughs> right. Um, it does start with a nice head fake because as soon as we get through that horrible credit sequence, we have Jennifer Connelly in this like you know medieval gown, you know, speaking this kind of Shakespearean-ish dialogue, 
And okay, it, I'm thinking because I've never seen it before. You know, maybe it's all set in this fantasy world, right? And then we find out no, she's just practicing for a play or something. And it made the music actually make sense. Yeah. Because at first it was kind of like, why Why are they doing this kind of music for what, what's not our world? And it turns out, oh, it is. it is. So maybe they should have began it with a more medieval, you know, mm-hmm. Renaissance festival kind of sounding yeah. music at the opening credits. It would have sold and that headphones a bit better. played Bowie, right. you know, when it's like, oh, wait a minute, we're in, we're in 1986. Yeah, that would have been better. Um, yeah. And I know Jennifer Connelly ultimately became a, a very talented actress, but damn, she was bad at this point. She was like 15, though. She was 14. I jacked. She, um, 14. Yeah, when they filmed this. So, you know, I, I, can't, give her, I can't give her too much um, yeah. for it, but, you know, she was hard to watch. <laughs> she, Yeah. Well, I think the character was just hard to, to watch, honestly, mm, more than anything else, because yeah. it was just just an awful character right awful awful (laughs) and even like the redemption at the end was just kind of like not even like a being a human to her parents like hey how was the you know the night out or whatever you know that was barely a redemption arc and if if anything exactly um... exactly there was it was kind of like an oh she's putting her toys away good oh let's go play with the goblins what yeah (laughs) Uh, but the goblin chorus at the beginning was really the only thing making it watchable when they were kind of egging her on to say the words just right. Yeah. I did get a kick out of that. And generally, for the most part, with one glaring exception, I enjoyed all of the Muppets in the movie. I think, I mean, some Muppets are more interesting than others. Mm. Uh, like the Fire Gang Muppets were interesting. They were the glaring exception. That that, that was intolerable. But it was also a musical number. Um, so... Right, right. There were some weird effects in there, too. And, mm. like, just them dancing in this thing with flying heads. And, and I'm just going to call myself out on it right now. I'm going to be using the word intolerable a lot during this review. <laughs> um when the kid was taken, that was very nicely timed because she walks out after saying the words and the, he stopped crying at just the perfect moment. Just added right. some nice suspense. Right. Like 14 minutes in, and, you know, it's when she finally, when she begins the quest. And I'm pretty much like, this is just going to be a fantasy in the end, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Expecting that. And then 22 minutes in, I was kind of wishing the Goblin King would come and take me. <laughs> Um, I, I his entrance was nicely done when he suddenly shows up at her window with the you know uh, what do they call it um, gravity gravity juggling I think um, hmm. the, the, those little you know plastic clear balls that you know you oh, oh right right uh, contact juggling that's what it is um, I have one of them around here I tried to learn it for about a week and <laughs> lost interest um, and although the scene where he turned the the ball into the snake was just hilarious because it was so like cheesy ADCG. Oh yeah, <laughs> very much so. And then they're in her room, and suddenly they're teleported out of the house into the labyrinth. It just they didn't even make a production of it. No, it was bizarre. It's only a model. Yeah. And the outside, this a bit more holy grail to it. Yeah, the outside of the labyrinth, I swear, looked like an old Star Trek uh, TOS series uh, set. <laughs> no, they never. That that was too advanced for that. You're forgetting how. Oh well, yeah, true. <laughs> how primitive yeah. the original series was. <laughs> I also did not need to see a Muppet, Muppet pissing. <laughs> When she comes across Hoggle, the the one who betrays her like five times, but she still forgives him, he's pissing into this pond. <laughs> well, if you remember, like the the Muppets, I think he originally wanted to do an adult show, mm-hmm. you know, and which is to, kind of why I'm surprised they haven't just given them a late night talk show yeah. to do. And to be fair, the original Muppet Show was not as for kids as people like to think it was. Hmm. It was kind of, kind of geared for everybody. True. 
you know, there's sure, stuff in there for adults. I was a kid and I was into it. Yeah, we just actually, in our, our backyard movie series, we just watched the latest Muppet movie, which is interesting because I don't even think I realized that this was a Henson uh, movie. I haven't even seen, I haven't seen any of the recent ones. Are they decent? This is the one with Jason Siegel from mm-hmm. like, I think just a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it was pretty damn good. Oh, I'll have to check them out. Because I think, yeah, they're all on D+, D plus, so I'll, I'll check them yeah. out. Um, but Hoggle, this this Muppet, completely outacts Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> and then she starts down the labyrinth, and we get this Miami Vice music. <laughs> this is a case where they went with current pop music in a fantasy movie. And, okay, granted they have Bowie in the movie, but... Right. His songs aside, they did not need current pop music. It just doesn't work with that environment. Right. I mean, this there's just no justice in the world. Because Bowie originally <laughs> wanted to do, back in the 70s, wanted to do a musical version of 1984. Uh-huh. And it became Diamond Dogs. Huh. And, and, you know, because of Orwell's widow, he couldn't. Right. And then he winds up. This, this is the musical he winds up getting to do. Mm-hmm. And Seriously. I can't fault him because, you know, Jim Henson movie in 86. Yeah. You know, who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't jump at that chance? And then he's handed the script. This really seemed like a slam dunk. But as she's wandering through the maze, she happens upon this little worm muppet who I swear they referenced in Thanksgiving 3. Oh, that little character. That's a movie I wouldn't mind watching again. <laughs> almost identical. I mean, it's been a few years. I, I watched the first one every Thanksgiving Eve. It's been a few years since I've seen three, but I swear they referenced that character almost verbatim in Thanksgiving 3. I think uh, you're right. That, now that you mention it, I'm, I'm remembering the, the, the worm you're talking mm-hmm. about from this. And then, yeah, even like the accent, yeah. I think, was the same. I wish I had seen this before Thanksgiving 3. I would have loved that more. Um, yeah. And the scenes with Bowie and the Muppets during the magic dance, it's just, it's like a bad Muppet show scene. <laughs> I mean, I've heard magic dance referenced a lot. That opening line gets referenced, because a lot of people I know love this movie, and they get reference it a lot, and it was intolerable. Um, <laughs> granted, neither of us is the target demo, you know. Very true. You know, neither of us is a teenage girl in the eighties who has a thing for Bowie. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I don't want to know about the bi- biology of those two-headed muffets behind the shield, because <laughs> one head was above the shield and the other head was below it. <laughs> I thought that I thought that was an interesting. Scene. <laughs> They're bickering yeah. between each other. <laughs> Well, the bickering two heads thing has been done a billion times, and it's it's always it always amuses me. But the yeah, putting the yeah. heads in those places, assuming they're on one person, one being, right? Um, yeah, and if they're on two beings, where are the legs for the second one? Um, well, the bickering between the dwarf and you know those, <laughs> and then they explained the two guards' riddle. You know, one can only tell the truth, one can only lie. Yeah. I love that riddle. I love that they explained it. I have to give it another half brain for that. <laughs> By the way, um, this was Jim Henson's last feature. Wow, really? And the poor reception contributed to a difficult period in his career. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, this did not. No. This didn't gross well, if no. I remember right. Um, also, the um, conceptual designs were by Brian Froud, who had worked with Henson on Dark Crystal. Oh, so Brian Froud, that's the baby's father. Okay, w- was it the actor who played the father? Um, no, no, I think, if I recall correctly, Froud did a voice for one of the Muppets. Oh, okay. Because, yeah. like, Toby Froud is the full name of the baby. Oh, Okay. Oh, and, okay. So they named the kid. They named the family after the guy who came up with the designs. That makes sense. And then the the funny thing is, this baby. If you look at his IMDb, it's his only acting appearance. Oh, oh, oh! You mean but, okay? I'm I'm finally understanding what you mean. The kid's right. actual name is Toby Froud. But he grows up 
to be a special effects, you know, artist okay, himself. So it probably is Brian Froud's kid. His, <laughs> right. his actual real life father is Brian Froud. Now I understand. <laughs> so yeah, he grows up and he's like worked on like King yeah. Kong and Makes stuff. Makes sense. Yeah, like it does the effect. His fa- his father is you know a designer who's worked with Henson. Kids got a leg up. Yeah, you know, and if he's he's talented, then you know he's 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 got a job in the industry. Um, but this was his only uh, on screen acting. Yeah, <laughs> the crying at the camera, and right. kind of walking around the Escher painting. And then she falls down this hole in the floor, and we have the helping hands scene. A bunch of hands reaching out, you know grabbing her as she falls. Again, Jennifer Connelly was 14 when they filmed this. <laughs> so that was a little... Mm. It, and it's weird. They 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 don't, you know, it's suggestive without being too overly suggestive. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's strange. Yeah, uh, especially when we get to the ballroom scene. That's just... That got... Yeah. Just wrong that that was hard it was difficult um <laughs> disturbing is, is the word i meant to say um it was disturbing Not intolerable um but i'm torn because i love the muppets in the film but Connolly and the musical numbers are just horrible and bowie when he's not singing was okay <laughs> Um, the, oh, the, another thing I liked, again, the Muppets. The little creatures that were biting Ludo when she first finds him, the Bigetti. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and what... the whole slapstick in that scene was very Jones. Now, a Ludo-Sarah love story is one I, I mean, even you could have gotten behind that if they oh. had actually gone there. I mean, they kind of... <laughs> there are some lines that suggest that um, um, the um, Hoggle, the, the little curmudgeon dwarf has a crush on her. It's actually because he's he doesn't have any friends. It's a it's a platonic thing. Right. But I even would have been okay with that because it's a fucking Muppet. <laughs> oh, but let me tell you, though. If they did a hoggle Sarah Ludo love triangle, this would have been fucking on the wreck list. I don't care about <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> if they went there, she's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. I saw her first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, and then we get to the fucking fire gang. <laughs> but we actually recorded that song like his oh, own yeah. version with his vocals <sighs> <sighs> what was the song anyway i forget oh sh- chill down with the chilly down with the fire gang or something oh jesus that's bad <laughs> yeah yeah um, they, i just there's a, an interesting story that just got posted about Bowie that I heard on the Bennington show and it's it's making its way around the internet it's about a, a fireman who who um he pretty much outed Bowie about a, a lot of the stuff he was doing mm-hmm. he was he was cooking for this firehouse for years in New York City oh, like wow. for two nights a week <laughs> i just kind of like took them all under his wing you know like left stuff in his will for oh. them and everything. Oh, nice. But yeah, it's it's quite a, an interesting story. I don't want to get into like huh. the details here, of course. Um, back to the movie and the fire gang. I I, I did enjoy <laughs> seeing Sarah rip their heads off. <laughs> yeah, that was that was an interesting scene. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> then we get to the bog of eternal stench, which is just a big fart joke. Yeah. Um. I, I did like uh, the bridge guard fighting Ludo, though. You know, anytime the Muppets threw down, I was down for that. Um, well, especially if you have a Muppet Black Knight as yeah. a dog. Basically, <laughs> yeah. And then the ballroom scene, again, disturbing. Um, although, I mean, if, if certain people are to, believe, to be believed, Bowie and a 14-year-old, not, you know, the first time. Um, no, no, not at all. <laughs> Apparently the seventies were um Yeah. Yeah. Um but by the last half hour of the movie I was actually even tired of the Muppets. Yeah. By the time they got to the hallway in the giant, I was pretty much like, Oh look, my phone. <laughs> the battle scene was fun though. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah, the Fraggle Rock uh yeah. 
summoning of the uh it's just a nice bolts. big it's a big battle scene that's all muppets except for jennifer connelly hiding behind some stuff and probably bowie walking through a couple of scenes right um the escher room love that half a brain um <laughs> And then when she realizes that the Goblin King has no power over over her, she kind of dismisses him, but it's the way it's done, it's just this random combination of images that's just pure style over substance, like ridiculously right. 80s. It just 80s run amok. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the, the redemption scene that was not a redemption scene at all. Right. I mean, you know, she starts off kind of trying to redeem herself and then just decides she wants to play with her friends. Well, and, I, and at first I was kind of like, did this ruin the whole Cambellian hero's journey that they were building? Which, you know, they, you know, ditching materialism, believing in others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess the difference is in the end, instead of playing with toys, she, she actually was playing with friends. Yeah, because she's kind but, of a loner herself for the movie, most of the movie. But it it also didn't mean growing up in the end. No, no, no. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's what I'm like, my jaw just dropped. I'm like, wait, what? What is this? <laughs> a I mean, goblin party? What? Normally I'd be down for subverting a hero's journey, but this just subverted it in the worst way possible. I think it did. I think it, it was like... As if Frodo was just like, you know what? I'm just going to fucking stay in my uh, yeah. hobbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Fuck those guys. On to sequels and remakes. Oh, do we have to? <laughs> Tokyo Pop published the four-volume comic sequel, Return to Labyrinth, between 2006 and 2010. In January 2016, it was announced that a sequel was in development, which screenwriter Nicole Perlman described as more of a spin-off in the same fictional universe. That could be interesting as long as it's not, you know, a musical and, you know, it, it's good. It could be good. The universe is interesting. Ah, I don't know. It, it, the problem was it was, you know, the uh, antagonist is all powerful mm-hmm. until he's not. Right. And, and can just do anything and, and until he can't. And the, the door is just, you know right in front of you you just have to look at it yeah i I think it's it's everybody who got to the script after terry jones right and and, you know jones you could still hear his voice and some of the you know bantering and it's the the bickering and bantering is probably the strongest Mm -hmm. part of the movie but i just can't see coming back to this honestly i mean i mean this is worth it is iconic to a certain segment of people if you were right. in the Target demo, you love this movie. Um, but it is very much a relic of its time. Yes. It, it may have even really hurt Bowie's career the more mm-hmm. th- I think about it. Because think about this. Before this, you know, Bowie had China Girl and, you know, he had... Serious uh, Moonlight Jean. really wounded his career. Well, no, that was... That, that was, was after this? I think it was before this. I think yeah. that was... that You know, he was really big commercially before this well yeah and then oh, it, oh, i mean artistically killed him ruined his career but yeah commercially this well, yeah probably hurt him too. i think he knew he was going he knew he was going to sell out and he knew he wanted mm-hmm. to make some money so right. you know he signed the big sony deal and right. you know wanted to live up to that but then doing this after this commercially uh-huh. i mean you had uh never let me down again you know day in day out just stuff that was not mm-hmm. good yeah he didn't really find his footing again in an interesting way until the nineties. Wow, until Reeves yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Tim came up to him and right. until Reeves came 90. up to him backstage and said, Stop doing this <laughs> And then they formed Tim Machine and right. he re- resurrected his career. Right. Uh Under Brains. Under Brains. Uh Love the Muppets didn't like anything else um love a couple of references like i said bought it a brain between them i'm going three and a half ah man this was tough to get through um uh i thought really thought i was going to enjoy this a hell of a lot more but Mm -hmm. uh, i'm going to it's uh the muppets are interesting but 
they they're just not even watchable and <laughs> they're not enough to carry the movie. Uh-huh, that's right. what it comes down to. All right, and what have we learned? Ah, it wasn't just the corridors that were endless, huh? <laughs> and I learned that not even Bowie and Muppets can make a musical enjoyable. <sighs> yeah. Now, if the Muppets had done the 1984 movie with them... Oh, please, yes. <laughs> Sam the Eagle is Big Brother. Oh, God. Yes, need that. Need Muppets 1984. Yes. That's it for a labyrinth. We're off next week... So until two weeks from now, when we'll be reviewing Sister Tempest, along with the short film Sweet Revenge and Here There Be Monsters, all of which were submitted to us via via email by their uh, respective filmmakers. That'll be fun. Yeah. Especially since Sister Tempest is directed by Joe Badon, who also did The God Inside My Ear, which we reviewed a few years ago. Which we both like. So fucked up, and I can't wait to see it. (laughs) Um, And it's got a great trailer. Uh, Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life. There you are. There you are. I got a bunch of titles. Um, I got I got three. <laughs> they just kept coming. Most of them I came up with before I even watched the movie. Oh, yeah? <laughs> um, based on a music video by Tim Pope. Do you remember who Tim Pope is? No. Directed a shitload of videos in the 80s, most notably Magic by the Cars. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, the 80s, the movie. Uh, Rock Sex Machina. Uh, the Muppets Take Mordor. Wait, what was the one before that? Rock Sex Machina. Rock Sex Machina. Because of the rocks that, that um, Ludo was able to move. That would be just a straight up Deus Ex Machina. I might, it might combine one of our titles okay. together, actually, um, but yeah, we'll, Rock, we'll see. Rock Sex Machina. The Muppets Take Mordor. Frank Furter Goes to Middle Earth. For Frank and Furter Goes to Middle Earth. Well, damn, I have Rocky Horror Muppet Show. <laughs> okay, we, we might have to pick there. Um, <laughs> this one I am not seriously suggesting. I, I, at this point, I just started riffing on Bowie titles. Um, this yeah. one I'm not seriously suggesting, but it it cracks me the fuck up, so I have to say it. Mupper Jet City. <laughs> I don't know. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this one, actually, I think this is my favorite of them, um, Scary Muppets. But, I don't know, um, between our, I, our Rocky Horror references, I, I think. I have a, well, this one might work better with a okay. Australian accent. Maybe the glam star ate your baby. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, let's see, a fragile co- fraggle cock. Mm-hmm. But then I was thinking we could combine the two, frag rock sex machina. Ooh. Or, or the Rocky Horror Muppet Show. show. <laughs>